AP Systems is now shipping the DS3 microinverter, which they tell me is the most powerful dual module microinverter on the market. Well, is it? And why does it matter? Here to make the pitch is Jason Higginson, Senior Director of Marketing for AP Systems. Hey there, Jason. Thanks for having me. So the most powerful dual module microinverter. It's a mouthful. <laughs> no one's ever told me their thing is the most powerful or industry leading. I'll bet. Oh, wait. Yeah. Everyone says that. <laughs> so, so you got me here. Uh, I guess dive into it. First of all, I think it's important to note that uh, the DS3, we're calling it DS3 because it, the D stands for dual input. So it serves more than one uh, PV module. Uh, the S is for split phase or, or single phase is what we call it here. And it's the third generation. So a lot of installers are familiar with our YC500. And then we created this YC600, which at the time was was really powerful. And so we came out with, uh, with three new models on the DS3, uh, the DS3S, the DS3L, and uh, the DS3 by name only, which is... Uh, uh, a record setting 880 watts. So what makes this a little bit uh, unique is uh, not only is it more powerful, it's also smarter. It's got this new cooling topology, which you know looks really cool, um, but, uh, but it, it definitely serves uh, an important purpose. And we also drop 20% of the, the internal components inside, which uh, help increase the, the reliability and uh, and it's also the the California Rule Twenty One. That topology is a part of that important architecture that helps it reach these new capacities. Yeah, and there's a, a bunch of things there I want to dig into, but I, I did want to stick on the the power part uh, for a minute before we sure. dig into those. How does its power as a dual module microinverter compare apples to apples to a single module microinverter? I guess let's start there. So typically, you know, with the the dual module. You know, you simply like divide by two to get the kind of the per channel or per panel uh, output. Uh, but when you're not looking at apples to apples, sometimes it gets it gets hard to, to see. So when we came out with our YC600, that was this powerful 300 watt output per channel. And at the time, that was uh, meeting or exceeding what the leading microinverters in the industry were doing as soon as that 600 launched. And then I think someone came out with a 350. And then someone came out with a, a 400 watt. And so with this DS3, it's setting this, this record of 440 watts output per channel. And uh, what's, what's interesting is our development team was, hey, with this new architecture, that cool topology I was talking about, they're like, I think we can go up to 960 with this thing, which is, which is ridiculous. Like nobody's making panels for, I mean, we're talking, you know, 650 watt panel like we don't need that at this time yeah. so but it we're able to do it and they did and so it it sets this like tremendous record the only thing we're talking about here in the u.s really is going to be that that 880 uh because the other one just uh we're using it in the in other parts of the world but not here but it's still important to talk about because ap systems is able to push that that envelope where these new ones fit into place is uh the ds3 is this 640 so per channel comes out to 320, which is a, just a little bit more powerful than our YC600. So it's it's really for the installers that are used to using our 600, where they want to, they have a lot of panels that they use that are lower than 400 watts. For the L, it comes in at 768. And then with the, the DS3 at 880, we really see that more for commercial systems. Do you think having the most powerful dual module microinverter in the residential space will make an impact. Even thinking of that 880, that's 440 per side. Residential modules are much smaller than that, at least right now, you know? So I guess, what, how do you address that size discrepancy? Like, should an, is an installer going to be excited about that? Or why should they be if they're not? Uh, it's, it's a funny story. When we, when we first uh, came up with this, this uh, potential with this new architecture. Uh, we talked to many of our our uh, our friendly installers and distribution partners about that, and they essentially told us it's too powerful for us. Like there is such a thing as too much power, so uh, the market's just not ready for that. So so we're like, okay, all right. So we dialed it back. We we came up with the DS3 L for lower power and the DS3 S for um, 
honestly, I can't remember what the S is for. <laughs> Small, whatever. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's less than the the beast of the DS3, but it's ideal for P PV modules that are under that 400 watt. Internationally, we're seeing a lot more, you know, PV panels over 400 watts. The U.S. is still working through some some supply of some some lower wattage uh, modules. But when we looked at the DS3L, we, we found something interesting. On your typical residential system uh, on a 200 amp panel, uh, many homeowner customers have 40 amps free or 20 amps free uh, for solar before they have to upgrade their panel, which is expensive. It costs like kind of three to four thousand dollars to upgrade your panel yeah, from yeah. 200 amps to a 400 amp panel. So if you have 40 amps uh, available, uh, most commonly, according to NEC code, you can only load 16 amps on this thing. So we discovered that no matter how much DC you have on the roof, you have this, this throttle, this output throttle, which is limiting how much you can put onto each breaker. No one ever done this before. No one's worked the math backwards, you know, from that 16 amps to determine, you know, how much, uh, we can put onto each string and really maximize that. So that's that's why we came up with that 768 exactly, uh, the watts on that microinverter. So it's 384 per channel, and many uh, installers like to use a you know 1.2 or 1.25 DC to AC ratio. You know, it, it seems to me that a big advantage here in the microinverter space now is avoiding the the issue of clipping as we're going forward, right? Yeah, that's absolutely true because you. You can now accommodate uh, those higher wattage PV modules. Um, in fact, you know, with the the DS3L, you know, up to what 480 watt PV modules, which are rarely used in, in residential, but you can do it. Is there then an argument about really putting up as much DC as you can on the roof, since you have the ability to, I guess, handle all of it, like really oversizing, you know, beyond it can get a little disingenuous in the fact that where when you have a homeowner that you know you're going to put 7600 watts ac output you know with this system you can oversize the the system appropriately so that as the system gets older and there's slight degradation over that way you're still hitting your your output and also you're you're meeting the shoulders of the of the curve so there are some manufacturers out there who recommend dramatically oversizing the system. And what that invariably does is it just, you end up being able to charge the homeowner more for system output they will never realize. And, um, and so there are some that argue, yeah, well, I can, I can make more money on a system like that. And my response to that is, yeah, until you come up against a bid where you're facing another installer bidding AP systems for the same amount of output, less DC on the roof is going to beat you every time. So another thing to kind of switch gears a little bit, another mm -hmm. reason installers like the single module microinverter usually is kind of the simplicity of it. Yeah. It's pretty straightforward. Um, no need to think in multiples of two. Um, so I'm wondering, are am I gaining any advantages by going with the dual module approach? Uh, and, any other installation efficiencies uh, worth noting? You have fewer inverters to purchase. You have fewer inverters that you need to stock, uh, but most importantly, few, fewer inverters to install on the roof. And so think about that in terms of, you know, not just uh, labor and reliability, but also uh, cost. Um, you also have fewer points of failure. When we look at using fewer inverters um if you look at uh the fourth line down inverters per 20 amp circuit so we have five on ours but when we compare it to a, like a micro inverter traditional micro inverter system very popular end phase um it's significantly more inverters so compare the five to the 16 i mean it's three times as many components on the roof three times as many parts three times as many you know uh things to uh, to install. So when you're looking at the the total output, they're all fairly equivalent with the the, the plus ones that can hit those higher wattage uh, uh, modules than the the standard IQ7 IQ8, but if you look at the max PV module STC rating at the bottom. So with the DS3L you compare it with up to 480, the the in phase units 300, 360, 
they're not prepared for these PV modules that reach over 400 watts. And what that allows to do us to do is do less with more. So we're able to kind of condense the power that goes on the roof because not everyone has, I mean, look at the total number of PV modules that you need for an IQ7 or for an IQ8. You need 32 PV modules. Can your roof handle 32? Right. You know, for these two circuits, but 20 PV modules, you might be able to do that. So you could get this uh, this same output, this you know 7600 watts output with fewer PV modules overall, and and so visually, because I'm a visual person, <laughs> what that looks like for me is okay. We got 10 micro inverters. We got it serves 20 panels, compared with say 26 on the the IQ7 plus IQ8 plus or 26 PV modules. Um, but that didn't even hit the 7,600, it hit 7,500. Okay, so how do we max out that circuit with traditional microinverters? Well, you need 32 of the inverters. You need 32 of the panels. Back, I couldn't even fit them all on the screen. Hang on. <laughs> no. Move these over here. There. So now you visually see, you know, how much uh, you're putting in. But think about this in terms of installers that are selling to the homeowner. Hey, I can put 7,600 watts on your roof. And uh, regardless of how they achieve it, they're going to do a dollar per watt for those, those homeowners. I'm going to put this much on your roof. This is going to be your output. And from the installer viewpoint, I can either pay for 10 inverters and 20 panels, or I can pay for 32 inverters and 32 PV panels. So three times the inverters, 60% more PV modules. You know, if you can only put say 10 PV modules on, on a roof, uh, you really want the most, uh, the highest power density. So again, taking a, a traditional microinverter like like the end phase um, and, and looking at how much more you can do with less. Uh, so with the, the DS3L, for example, we can do um, you know, up to 60% more power output than the IQ7, IQ8 uh, with 15. PV modules, it's still the same because of because math. <laughs> and um, but even with our um, our DS3S, which is our lowest out of this new DS3 series, it's still 37 percent more AC power output. So for those with smaller homes or in installers with projects that they're trying to you know get uh, 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 a decent amount of power output on a small roof. You know, we now have a solution for that. Those numbers to me make it obvious, but I, I still, I guess, want to ask the question though, in terms of the actual uh, cost all in then, you know, so you're paying yeah. for fewer microinverters yeah. uh, and fewer modules, but they are maybe more likely the higher efficiency, higher priced panels versus maybe yeah. the, the, the cheaper. So what's the sticker price comparison? That's exactly what we've been looking at in the industry is the, the higher wattage PV modules aren't so significantly more expensive. The curve tends to flatten out at the higher end. When we compare the same system output, because of the sheer number of panels you have to put on the roof, the math comes out to significantly more. Even though you're having to put higher capacity PV modules on the roof, you're doing less of them. And so the benefit overall is like, even with this system size, you're doing less with more, but you're also, you're paying less. You have a lower embedded cost and you can either pass that on to the homeowner or you can simply, you know, offer them what you were, or charge them what you were paying, uh, what you were offering before, we, you know, with the same system cost and, and pocket that that's all profit. Yeah. So you, you could have better margins selling that way then. Right. Yeah. So installers could make, you know, a thousand, 1500 bucks more just in panel pricing alone. You mentioned earlier the the cooling topology. I mean, maybe it's too nerdy to dig into, but I was curious, like <laughs> how much how much more that improved, you know, versus I, you know, whatever that was before. Uh, we didn't want to add any fans. We wanted to go increase in capacity, but as soon as you add a component like a fan, and a fan can fail, uh, then you're significantly reducing your reliability and creating more issues in the field. So it really all had to be just convection cooled. So just by air movement around the device. And so how do you do that? Well, we've tried heat sinks in the past, we've tried other things, and this uh, this new design that we came up with and really allows for the maximum amount of ambient air cooling around those, those devices. So 
uh, not only uh, can they have these these uh, tremendous capacities of power output, but they can also handle high temperatures too. So very cool, uh, Jason. <laughs> and <laughs> nice pun. With, and yeah, and with that, I think uh, that that wraps us up for today. Thanks for taking the time uh, to walk us through all of this on the pitch. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it.